Greetings, citizens of Nerdtropolis. Sean Todd here, the mayor of Nerdtropolis, and on this episode of Real Insights, my guest is Jeff Rowe, the director of TMNT Mutant Mayhem. Jeff, I truly appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to chat of with Nerdtropolis. Yeah, I'm super excited, man. You know, I always wanted to talk to you, um, not about this movie, about, you know, some of the stuff you've done in the past, but um, there's no secret. I am a TMNT super fan. <laughs> so definitely <laughs> stoked to talk to you about the best Ninja Turtles movie ever uh, to date. Thank you so much. <laughs> that means that from a super fan, that means a lot. Yeah, uh, I'm an 89 baby. So I grew up in the 90s with all that TMNT stuff. Um, so you know, that was definitely my world. But first off, I have to share with you that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem is the Nerdtropolis animated movie of 2023. I saw that. It's amazing. <laughs> that's it. Thank you uh, so much. It's, that's uh, that's I I incredible. And it's it's such it's such an honor. Um, it's it's a stiff competition this year. It's a it's a really good year for animation. So uh it just means a lot to 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 us that that we'd come out on top yeah it, to be honest it is it was a stiff competition there was so many great animation uh last year um but then they all stood out but there is a, something super special about mutant mayhem and also you may not have gone the word when we first started doing these nerdtropolis worlds that the mitchells versus the machines was the nerdtropolis animated movie of the year in 2021 what? as well yeah so you're two I for two even i was i was starting turtles at that point so i think i was like uh busy and distracted but that's amazing that's uh, uh so i've made two nerdtropolis <laughs> movies of the year uh you're two for two honor. you got that's a pretty good start so oh, let's no. see Ooh. let's see how long you go <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i must say there is something truly special about mutant mayhem uh, I was surprised by the sudden announcement of a new TMNT movie when it first came out. Uh, when were you first informed about it? And how did you feel when you were asked to join Mutant Mayhem? I mean, I was wrapping up on Mitchell's at the time, and I was talking to my agent about what comes next. And uh, he asked me uh, if I like Seth and Evan movies. And I was like, yeah, I love love Seth and Evan movies. Super bad. It's a masterpiece. Like, they're, 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 they're great. And then he's like, do you like the Ninja Turtles? And I'm like, I, of course I love the Ninja Turtles. That's I was like, you were born in 89. I was born in 86. Like, that is my childhood. It was just like targeted for me as a kid uh, uh i grew up with it uh and my agent was like well they're making a a, a ninja turtles movie it's uh them as real teenagers set in high school uh you won't get the job but uh i can set up a meeting and i was like i will do anything set one meeting set 10 meetings uh let me let me have a shot at this and then i just went through like it was like progressively more difficult boss battles where I would just meet like more and more important people until the the final meeting with uh, uh, Seth and Evan. And, and we just talked for 30 minutes creatively about what we thought this film could be. And uh, uh, they they thankfully thought that I was the right person for for the job. And uh, I'm, I'm really grateful I, I got this opportunity. After the work of the Mitchells versus Machines, I mean, there's no doubt, you know, you're the right guy. For this job and what a team to come up with all this but to be honest a lot of things stood, stood out to me in this movie one what really elevated this film ex the exceptional score by trent reznor oh, yeah. and attica ross i was blown away when that intro scene and it's like goes hard that's yeah that, you know it just goes hard i'm like this is like 90s like <laughs> 90s style just go hard into it and i loved it uh it complimented everyone else's work but how did you get them on board and did they receive any notes prior to going to work on such a masterpiece? I play that on Spotify in the background sometimes when I'm working, it hypes me up at the same it's, time. It's amazing. It's such a good track. I have videos of us all like dancing to it on the mix stage. Like the moment that beat drops, it's just like, Oh, like it, it's so, it goes so much harder than, than I think anyone expected. And it, it really sets the the tone uh, for, for the film. It, it, it like, those guys are are really brilliant musicians and and uh, are are really smart. And the score is is interesting because it's not it's not their their typical kind of scoring work. Uh, it, it's very beat driven, very rhythmic. It, it really they looked at the landscape of needle drop that we were putting into the film and created something that was like different, but also complements and sits beside the uh, the source film. 
and uh, uh, I'm just really so impressed with the work they did, and 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 I'm so so proud of the score. And I still don't know why they said yes, but uh, we we you know uh, they liked Mitchell's versus the Machines. We got a meeting with them. Seth and I went to uh, Trent's house and pitched him and and Atticus the uh, uh, the movie and. Um, it was like I went into like a fever dream fugue state, just talking about uh, artistically what we were trying to accomplish, and and they were like, "All right, sounds good, sounds good. Let us see a script." And uh, and then we're like, "Great, we'll send it right over." And then left the meeting, and uh, I was like, "Seth, the script isn't good enough. We have to like make this better." And then we rewrote it. We had just rewritten the entire thing in a weekend, and then we like rewrote it again in another weekend so that we could send it to Trent and, and Atticus and not uh, not be embarrassed by it. That that score of theirs, I mean, the great film, but like without it, I feel like the tone would have been completely different. They set oh, yeah, the tone. No, it elevates it. It, 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 and it grounds it uh, uh, emotionally too. And 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 what I love so much about their scoring work is it's never it's never saccharine it's not mawkish it's it's just like uh like it's not like oh and now here's the sad part and here are the sad strings it's it's it, they they're able to capture emotions like in between emotions like the feeling restless feeling uh let down feeling like uh, uh, longing, like they 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 paint with such an an interesting palette. Uh, it's 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 really impressive. Yeah, they did a great job, and you know the script went through like a lot of changes. But did the creators themselves, you know Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird, did they have anything to give y'all that you could use, kind of little tidbits or insight that y'all utilized in the film? Well, we didn't show Kevin until very, very late. Uh, and and we showed him because we we I wanted him to do this uh, this cameo. Uh, it's it's my favorite Easter egg in the film, but the first human who helps splinter up and kind of turns the tide in 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 the the act three climax is voiced by by Kevin Eastman. And um uh, it, it was, you know, it was terrifying to meet him and record him and then also say, like, Hi, sir. I've uh, taken your characters and your entire life and this uh, uh, beautiful thing that you've created and done something with it. Like, is that okay? But he he was so cool and easygoing and 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 complimentary and 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 he's just the most lovely human and uh, and and that was a real dream come true getting to to share this film with him and uh, um, have him participate in the smallest way. Yeah, I met him twice and I got to go to San Diego Comic Con where y'all had that awesome panel. I had my Donnie mask on. I was so hyped and y'all showed a clip from the movie. Like, I guess that'd be the first 20 minutes with um, y'all on stage. And man, I just oh, felt the emotion just watching that. I mean, I was just hyped even further. Um, and then I got to talk to him afterwards. And so, yeah, it's just awesome that it's like a big turtle family that's um, brought yeah. this um, to life from, from, you know, the creation of the turtles to now. It's awesome. And, you know, speaking of the script, was sidelining Shredder your idea and to bring to Superfly as the main villain, which was, I think it's a brilliant move to hold off on Shredder um, because the world of TMT is much bigger than just one iconic villain. Um, so can you talk about that decision to bring Superfly into like the spotlight? Yeah, it's, 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 we had Shredder in the film for a while and we were trying to make it work and we couldn't make it work and we couldn't find a fresh take on the character. And, and at some point, we, we would have a, a, our story process was one where we would just have a lot of open conversations, oftentimes uncomfortable because it's like you put so much work into something and it's hard to say like, well, I don't think this is working. Like we tried really hard. And honestly, I think this thing is, 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 is busted, but, uh, it, we had a really safe nurturing in, environment where, where we could do that. And, um, yeah, like I, I think, at some point we realized Shredder wasn't working. He's too big of a character. He's too important to the franchise. He takes up too much space. And also the story of the turtles is about um, being mutants and feeling like outsiders. And wouldn't it be great if the villain was someone they could relate to was a, was a mutant like them. Uh, and that's where, 
we tried versions of Baxter Stockman, Baxter Stockman in the process of turning into a fly, but just like starting with a, with a villain who had a very similar backstory to the turtles, but maybe kind of took away the wrong conclusion. It's very like, like Dr. X Magneto uh, uh, in their kind of like similar origins, different execution of, of, of what to do next. And, uh, and it just really made so many story points come together and make sense. And, uh, 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 once we had that, it, it opened up a lot of room to make a lot of other really important changes. Yeah. They're, they're all done great. And I loved it. And I have a silly question for you because I interpreted the one scene differently. Does Stockman die? Uh, it, it's the, the, it seems as though he did. Okay. It's, uh, he definitely, <laughs> it, it, we definitely on camera kill him. You okay. know, I had a lot of conversation with people about this. So I was one. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I have to, uh, as this it might be a hot take, but uh, I truly love watching John Hughes films. And I felt like I was watching one when I was watching uh, Mutant oh, Mayhem. Sure. Was there some type of influence from John Hughes? I'm not just talking about that Ferris Bueller day off scene. I just felt like watching it. It was just like an animated John Hughes film just because of the motion and being, you know, teenagers. Uh, any yeah. influence of John Hughes in you? Uh, I saw him. I mean, I think, I think there's some, is some John Hughes influence that lives in, in all filmmakers. Like he, he's, he's one of, he's one of the greats, uh, uh, when it comes to just like writing characters, like real characters, like people that, you know, who are lovable and flawed in the way that your friends and, and family are. He, he was such a master of, of that. And, uh, uh, you know, we all, we all, <laughs> all of us working in 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 character comedy li live in his shadow uh, uh a little bit um but uh yeah like uh i think i think he just he really tapped into something with like teenagers and and captured something true in in his work and uh like we looked at like breakfast club uh a lot that was a contender to be one of the films in in the film uh, but ultimately we landed on Ferris Bueller because the image of um, like a crowd of people cheering for a teenager, it just was the perfect end goal for the turtles. It seemed like the furthest, the most impossible thing for them to attain. And, and that film just gave us that visual. Uh, 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 and that was, that was perfect for the story. But I just wanted to thank you for delivering such an amazing uh, Ninja Turtles film. I mean, the best, the best. And I'm looking forward to more. Don't go anywhere, please. Stick around with this franchise because uh, you definitely know your way around it. But also anything else you deliver to us, we're going to love. And I like to see some of your other original work, like the Mitchells versus the Machines. What a knockout that was. And uh, love to see more stuff like that. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you for for taking the time, and thank you for being such a such a big fan of the film and 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 doing so much to root for it. Once again, this is Sean Taj, the mayor of Nertropolis, and stay tuned for more movie news, reviews, interviews, and trailers.